This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I have with me today my longtime friend, Mark Newton. He's the head of corporate sustainability for Samsung Electronics. Welcome to the Impact Podcast, Mark. John, thanks so much. What a great opportunity. We've been talking about this for years and um, looking forward to chatting with you. This today. is special because I know you personally and I know your journey, but our listeners and our viewers don't. And that's what we're going to get into today and then be talking about all the important and great things you're doing at the uh, iconic brand Samsung, the leading brand in, in manufacturing electronics on the planet. What a, what an opportunity and what a, what a great position you have. But first, I want you to share a little bit what I know listeners, the Mark Newton, how did you even get on this journey of sustainability? And, uh, and how did you get here where you are today? Yeah, well, it, you know, I think everyone that's in my role came at it from a different direction. And my story isn't any more unique than others, except maybe it's longer than most. <laughs> uh, I, I graduated uh, from the University of Texas. Um, in 1993, and I had a PhD in chemistry. I got hired right out of school by Motorola, and um, this was before cell phones. So everyone's got a pager, and I got put into the Land Mobile Products Division, which was the two-way radios that you see in all the taxis and police cars, and that was the core of their innovation center. Wow. Um, we got a nasty gram from the Netherlands, uh, one of our customers, and they had ground up some of our two-way radios and, and said, hey, did you know that there's hex chrome and cadmium, things like that in your products? We ground them up. And, wow. and Motorola was like, what? Why'd you grind up our products? <laughs> and uh, because I had a background in polymer chemistry and they didn't really know what that meant, um, they handed me the project because these substances were found in plastics. And back then, you know, nobody was designing for uh, anything but performance in electronics. And so uh, nobody had even asked these questions before. Uh, nobody knew why we would be using these substances. So it wasn't that hard to figure out. Uh, I managed to track down our suppliers, uh, ask them why they were used, and they're used for pigments and heat stabilizers and things like that. And then I asked them, you know, if they had alternatives. And they said, yeah, but you never asked us. So I said, okay, great. Well, are they any more expensive? And they said, no. <laughs> I said, well, this is going to be an easy one. And so we were able to resolve this problem, but the light bulb went off, right? Um, we didn't know anything that was in any of our products. Uh, we didn't know the composition of hardly any of the materials, um, nor did we care. So I decided uh, with the support of my management um, to go on a quest and understand what was in all of our stuff. Mm. And they gave me a small team and they moved me up to the corporate research center in Schaumburg, Illinois, mm. and, uh, and, and everyone thought I was crazy. And everyone thought that was what I was going to do for the rest of my career. But it really didn't take that long because, as you know, when you get down into the supply chain, especially with materials, there's a lot of commonality yeah. with the different sorts of, um, you know, uh, suppliers. And so it, it all came down to, um, you know, a fairly relatively manageable set of materials, as complex as electronics are. And uh, then figuring out like what's what's in them um, took a couple of years. And we decided uh, as we were going through it to actually start thinking more proactively about uh, creating design guidelines so that when we're creating products, we could avoid some of these substances that we knew were going to be coming our way. I did some benchmarking early on to show that, you know, substance restrictions that started, let's say, in the toy industry or the food industry had a pretty repeatable 
uh, lag before they hit the electronics sector. And so using that sort of, um, you know, methodology, I was able to, to track what substances were probably going to be hitting us. And one of the first that we tracked back then was the transition away from lead and solder. And so um, <clears throat> before I knew it, and after I actually left Motorola and went on to work for other tech companies, I realized that that was one of the very first design for environment programs in the tech industry. And uh, so now every, every tech company has a, has a sustainability R&D function, has sustainability officers. And, uh, and throughout my career, I've taken on more and more responsibility. It's gone from you know, materials and circularity issues with recycling to energy efficiency and climate uh, impacts to social impacts and ethical sourcing and uh, philanthropy. And it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, and I've been able to work for some iconic companies along the way. <clears throat> well, you know, Mark, and I say this only with love and respect. When I met you, when I just got in the industry and knew nothing about really recycling, I came in the world, you were one of the first leaders in sustainability that I was ever exposed to. And I quickly learned that you were truly this was a DNA issue to you, and you were really one of the thought leaders and true leaders in sustainability way before it was cool to be talking about ESG, circular economy, chief sustainability officers, or anything else. I believe when we met, you were at Dell. Can you share some of the great brands and the seats that you've sat on leading up to this very important position that you have today at Samsung? Well, sure. Actually, when I left Motorola, <laughs> I left sustainability altogether and tech. Uh, well, not tech so much, but I went to go work for an inventor named Dean Kamen, oh, uh, who some some folks may know. Uh, they're listening to this po podcast. This is the inventor of the Segway, and uh, it was a fantastic opportunity to leverage more of my basic scientific skills. I was their chief chemist, and we worked on all kinds of great projects, uh, separating oxygen from air and creating. Uh, engines uh, that could run off of uh, dung and all kinds of neat things, as well as uh, these medical devices. But you know, I, I missed I missed the electronics world. I had I had already spent a fair amount of time at at Motorola, and I had an opportunity to go work for Apple, uh, and so I did. So I went for work for Apple right around the time when the iPod was first being developed. And uh, if it weren't for, uh, you know, Steve's uh, deal with uh, the big three record industry companies um, to create the service that he had around uh, the iPod, it would have just been another MP3 player. Wow. So, you know, I've missed the boat on just about every IPO and, and stock opportunity in my entire career. I jumped out of Apple just at the right time <laughs> before they started making money. Uh, and, and went on to Dell, who at the time was actually um, just on fire. They were eating everybody's lunch. Right. Um, and so I, I came to Dell to, uh, to help them uh, develop their uh, environmental technology programs um, to transition to lead free um, and, to, and to put together um, you know, some of their basic policies around uh, recycling and, and, uh, and environmental sustainability. Um, during that time period, uh, they did something quite innovative, and it was ahead of any regulation um, with respect to recycling. They they partnered with Goodwill and uh, kicked off that reconnect program, um, right. which was a, a great success and a great way to leverage um, the fact that consumers want to hang on to their junk, but they love to donate. Um, and so the way to get these scrap, the scrap out of their hands, which was piling up in basements and garages and closets everywhere. Um, was to leverage, uh, you know, an infrastructure that they were comfortable with, and that was the donation process. So it, it was a great partnership. It helped to gr drastically increase our uh, collection rates um, and then also met Goodwill's mission, um, which was to put people to work. So that was a fantastic partnership. And, right. and you know, the issues just continued to uh, evolve at Dell, um, and I was given more and more responsibility uh, and when I left, I had an opportunity to go work for one of those iconic companies that has uh, sustainability just integrated into their business model, and that was Timberland. And yeah. so it was a big leap jump, jumping out of tech and going to uh, the apparel and outdoor sector, but it was just unbelievable. Um, you know, I'd say I hate to paint things with a, a broad brush, but 
I'd say the apparel outdoor sector really had a much better handle on sort of social impacts and supplier issues with respect to labor and human rights. And the tech industry was further ahead, you know, on some of the materials and uh, environmental technology issues. And so there was a great opportunity to bring some of that in to the apparel sector, working with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and other uh, partners, but then also to learn uh, and build competence uh, on the social impact side and bring that back to the tech sector um, when I came back and, uh, and, and took on my current role with Samsung. Got it. Um, is, 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 you know, being that you were already, uh, you know, working in sustainability at Dell and then you went over to Tim, those, those skill sets though that you had were very transferable to materials change. Is that not sort of true? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, there's still there's still you know a huge amount of intersection between technology and and you know gear, outdoor gear and apparel. Um, I mean, just look look at today. Just look at the uh, collaboration that we've announced fairly recently at Samsung to address microplastics uh, in the ocean. I mean, there's millions of tons of microplastics on the on the seafloor bed, and there's more and more coming in all the time. Uh, and these things are shed. These are fibers, you know, that are shed um, through through laundry and other and other ways. And and they get into, uh, you know, our, our water system and into the into the food system. And so, um, you know, working with an innovator like uh, Patagonia, you know, who really understands the the ecological issue and the right. and the science behind the materials. Uh, with bringing together like a Samsung who totally understands, you know, washing, washing equipment and, uh, and all the engineering around, uh, around that um, is a, was a really kind of great and natural partnership that we announced at the consumer electronics show this year. So now you're, now you're at Samsung, you've got the head of corporate sustainability position for Samsung electronics America. You know, Mark, what I've learned over the years and much has been for, through your eyes as well. You've been a tremendous inspiration and mentor to me uh, in this journey uh, here at ERI. Sustainability means a lot of things to a lot of people and also to organizations It can mean different things. With regards to Samsung, who is the global, leading global manufacturer of electronics on the whole planet, I think you sell, give or take, and you correct me, correct my numbers, 500 million new devices a year, some number. That. I'm not going to contradict you, John. It sounds like a big number. I agree. <laughs> uh, you know, what does sustainability mean now in the position you're at at Samsung? To That's you? a great question. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that, actually, because I'm not going to really answer it in terms of like environmental or social responsibility. Um, I look at it very differently. I'm, I, I guess I'm a pragmatist. I've never been accused of being a tree hugger, but um, I, I've come to really appreciate this work because of the impact, um, positive impact that we can make. Right. And, and the, but the way I look at sustainability is more in terms of um, externalities that are not on the balance sheet, right? So these are things that we need to consider. Some of them are social and environmentally related, right? Okay. But these are things that we don't really quantify you know, in our P&L and, and because we don't have that information at the table, then we're, we have an incomplete amount of information to make the best decisions, right? So, so, the, so the idea is really kind of to bring these externalities in, to integrate these considerations in the business, and that way we can have the best information in front of us to make the best decisions. And if we do that, we're going to stay in business longer, which is another way to describe sustainability. Right, you'll be able to sustain. But you know, one of your taglines, one of Samsung's taglines, is "Together for Tomorrow." What does that mean to you, and what does that mean to Samsung in terms of you executing that vision? You know, uh, in terms of the United States and, and way beyond. Yeah. So, "Together for Tomorrow" and this idea of co-prosperity, yeah, um, is is just a is, is just this laser focus that we have on our customer. 
um, as as well as other stakeholders, you know, that we interact with in the course of doing our business. Um, you know, but I, but I'd say that the the it's it's part of our DNA. It's the way that we're that we're focused as a company that's that's consumer oriented. But at the same time, we have done a whole lot of um, uh, impact studies, and we and we know that this stuff is really important to Gen Z, right? And so uh, th this is these are our employees. Uh, this is uh, our next generation of customers. And and one of the things that we know also is that. Gen Z, they make up like 20% of our population, but they have less than a half a percent of spending power. Wow. So you, ca you can't reach them through normal marketing, right? It's got to be through education and engagement. And so, and so for that reason, you know, we've really started to, I think, um, communicate more effectively about some of the things that we've been doing for a long time. I, I would, one of the things I noticed when I came to Samsung was that I really hadn't heard much about what they were up to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the first thing you think is, well, they're not doing anything. Well, that's not the case. It's, I, it's more of a case of communicating effectively. And now that we know how important this is to our most important and most, and, and most quickly growing uh, segment of our, of our customer base, we're starting to think about not just talking about what we're doing, but why we're doing it. <clears throat> and one way that we try to put this together is this idea of connecting the dots between everyday changes, uh, small things that you can do in your life, because these are such big intractable issues that we're dealing with, you know, existential crisis, climate change, give me a break. Um, and, and, and then, but, but then connecting the dots to that meaningful impact. So, so that so that it's clear that the things that you know we do in our everyday lives, the, th the things that we can do, the small things we can do as a company, add up to something that's that's large and meaningful. And so talking about them both at the same time is the way that we're trying to communicate this. For those who just joined us, we've got Mark Newton with us today on the Impact Podcast. He's the head of corporate sustainability for Samsung Electronics America. To find Mark. And his great colleagues, you can go to www.sam.com. Mark, you know, you talk about education. Is, 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 are we seeing a sea change right now of Gen Z and other millennials and other generations now voting more with their pocketbook with regards to the true impact that brands are making than ever before? Or am I misreading that? No, you are reading it right. Now, like I said, Gen Z has a relatively small amount of purchase power on their own, but they actually have a very large influencing power. So indirect purchase power. Um, you know, your kids tell you what to buy, right? <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is that uh, that this has been studied, um, you know, extensively by so many, so many groups. And it's clear that the trend is moving towards um, a situation where there is an expectation um, it's becoming basically table stakes um, for companies to be focused on this. Um, and, and to some extent, if it can be communicated effectively and there's credibility and real trust that is built between uh, the company and the customer, that there is a, a definite uh, impact towards uh, purchase. Um, uh, and, and we see that. We see that in the data, um, both from a demographic standpoint, uh, based on age group, as well as year over year advances uh, in the propensity to actually put your money where, you're, where, the, where your mouth is. But besides purchasing, it's, it's about working for companies that care. Um, you know, uh, Gen Z really wants to be part of uh, the solution. Um, another thing that we find interesting is that they're over-indexed compared to most other um, age, age groups with respect to um, social responsibility. So th this idea of like where something comes from and, and how people are being treated during that process um, is more, much more, disproportionately more important to this generation than to than to other age groups. So this is usually a topic which most companies don't 
don't really message, right? right. Um, it's it tends to be sort of like a reputation management topic or or something that that you know you talk about from a compliance standpoint. Right. But this is actually something that that our, our consumers care about more and more, and so it's something that we're going to continue to uh, message uh, as we I, dial up. I, I also want to glance over something you just mentioned. Given that we're at almost zero employment right now, and and, and we've, we've just lived through not only the COVID tragedy, but also we're living through the great resignation. As a recruitment tool, what you're also saying is companies that actually care and make an impact have a greater chance of retaining that's right. and recruiting the best talent that's out there right now. That's exactly right, John. That's interesting. That's really interesting. You know, you know, you know, Mark, shameless plug. This is my Samsung phone. I have it. I carry it. I love it because you guys are truly one of the great innovators on the whole planet. Talk a little bit the importance of innovation, not only in making great products, also innovating in what you're doing in your sector and sustainability and how they go together and why that matters. Yeah, sure. I mean, we really, really see sustainability as a lens for innovation. Um, this is just another lever that we can pull when we're trying to find ways to really excite and delight our customers. Um, you know, this is, but what we have learned, I think also as we, as we develop these technologies is, is that in terms of the way that we present them, I think that the, the most effective way is to do it as a, sort of a gift with purchase. Mm. You know, rather than lean into these as the reason why you want to buy the product, the reason is the same reasons before, right? It's a it's cost effective. It helps you with your productivity. It helps you connect. All the things that technology does for you, it's reliable. Um, all of that stuff, right? That's the reason why, right? Um, and we know that sustainability is is a is a consideration, but but we're going to deliver sustainability to you whether you want it or not. I mean, that's kind of our focus. Um, and so we, we really feel as though there's, there's ways for us to do this um, that opens up new possibilities in, in the way that we're developing products. So I mentioned the, uh, the collaboration with Patagonia on microplastics. Right. That's a fantastic innovation um, right. that is really brought about by an understanding of, of some of these issues with single-use plastics and, and water stewardship. Um, another thing uh, that we're focused on, which is really kind of fun and cool, is um, is upcycling. So, you know, as you know, recycling is super important. We need to definitely uh, right. have uh, all these materials to continue to feed the product development cycle. And but the fact is that um, the best way, really, to lower your impact is to keep using a product. And especially, you know, a lot of these devices have very high levels of functionality, right. sensors and, you know, all kinds of other things, uh, cameras, storage, connectivity, but maybe they're not good for phones anymore or something like that, right? So why can't we use those for other sorts of devices? So we've got some programs that we've spun up around that um, that are very exciting, as well as um, uh, ways to get this idea into the hands of all consumers uh, through our Galaxy Upcycling at Home uh, uh, program that we uh, do that in partnership uh, with smart things. Um, another thing uh, which is really kind of cool is uh, you know the the since we live in such a connected world, right is the ability to use technology in a way that helps us make better choices. So uh, smart things is a, is a Samsung company um, and uh, think of it as sort of an IOT connected hub enabling, um, service. And one of the things uh, that, that we can do through our smart things app um, that we're, we've developed is this idea of managing um, and monitoring the energy use of all your connected devices in your home. And so having this knowledge is real power and being able to identify like what, what, what appliances have the the biggest load, uh, when they're when you're running them, uh, and then also knowing something about your utilities so that you can understand when the best time is to run some of those if you if you can uh, choose different times of the day to run them. Um, those are the kinds of things that are going to help us make better decisions and and live our lives more efficiently. You know, Mark, one of the things that I don't get to deal with that much is the issue of packaging. You know, I work more on the on the core materials that are within the electronics themselves. And as do you, 
but talk about the challenges and also the progress you've made with regards to packaging and sustainability. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's the first thing you throw away, right? <laughs> So, right. <laughs> and we shouldn't be shipping that much of it. When I was at, at Dell, actually, I worked with a fantastic packaging engineering team, and we came up with this idea called Cube Content and Curb. And so, Cube, let's not ship any more air than we need to with the product, right? Right. Uh, content, um, let's innovate. Let's let's bring recycled content in there. Let's let's uh, make sure that you know we're uh, you know not contaminating the plastic with something that's going to make it hard to recycle. And then related to that is curb. Let's not over innovate with regrettable you know uh, choices. Um, let, let's make sure whatever we're doing actually makes it so that we can easily recover this stuff um, so that they can go into curbside recycling so it can go through the MRF and we can actually recover these materials, keep them out of landfills. And I think those guiding principles just are just spot on. And so we have a very similar approach here at Samsung. And um, one of the things that we've been able to do is to um, you know essentially eliminate single-use plastics in our mobile packaging, and you know that's the first step. We have a lot of other package you know packaging uh, for other types of products, and some in some of those types of products, um, the cushioning and things like that are of critical. And uh, finding alternatives to things like EPS foam and stuff like that is a real significant challenge. Um, so, so we've taken on that challenge, um, and the other opportunities is to in, incorporate recycled content. Um, and so, all of our all of our packaging has at least fifty percent recycled fiber. Uh, and and then the other thing is to make sure that the fiber you are getting is sustainably sourced, right? So, um, all all of the um, the wood pulp that we use in any of our paper and, and cardboard um, is uh, is forest certified by. Wow. SFI or PEFC or FSC. So those are the kinds of ways that we think about it. Um, you know, use as little as possible, use as much recycled content as possible. And when we do shift, uh, shift, shift to things that can be easily recycled. It, it, it creates a challenge though, because, you know, at the same time, we want to incorporate recycled plastics. Wow. And most of the recycled plastics that you get, especially ocean plastics, come from packaging. Wow. So if we're eliminating plastics and packaging, well, where do you put that stuff, right? Wow. So it's a, it's a challenge. And, and, and that's, again, where, you know, we've got some innovation going on. So with the ocean plastics, for instance, we're, co we're, we're recapturing uh, fishing nets that would end up in the ocean. And there's, you know, there's a lot of them. There's like, uh, you know, three quarters of a million tons of fishing nets um, that get wasted every year. And so if we can just get one of those back, it's great. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but they're made out of nylon and there's not a lot of uses for nylon in, you know, in electronics products. And so we have to be innovative and, and figure out ways. Well, how do we take that stuff? How do we clean it up? How do we blend it? Uh, in with other materials that can give us a resin that we can use. And so we've been successful in that application. We found some great uh, uses for materials like that. But you really have to think out of the box because this, the, the, the polymers that are out there that are easy to collect that are in the trash are usually not the stuff that you want to put back into your products. That's so interesting. I'm going to get back to that. I want to talk more about design for sustainability in a second. But I want to go back to Samsung. You now are the, the, the head of corporate sustainability uh, for Samsung and Sa Samsung's of Electronics of America. Mark, Samsung is the number one brand on the planet in manufacturing electronics. So describe a little bit uh, the unique and rare position you're in as the leading brand and being the, 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 the top, uh, top of the food chain yourself now in sustainability. It's both the responsibility and, and I assume a, a heavy responsibility, but also a blessing because everyone's watching you. You're being watched. So you have the opportunity to inspire, but also people are gonna wanna also throw darts or, or, or worse at you. Explain that opportunity and how you toggle that and make that more into an inspirational venture instead of, uh, of course, the other side. Well, okay. That's a that's a loaded question, but I'll I'll take a stab at it. I, right. It's 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 actually a a very difficult um, thing. 
Right. Um, yeah. You know, because uh, if you if if you um, step out in front too far in front right. on a particular issue, time you know timing a mature sense of timing is almost everything in this business. Yeah. Um, and so if you step out too far in front and you really haven't thought through. Uh, you know some of the implications of the innovations uh, that you want to that you want to bring right. forward. Um, then, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be the first one to to take an arrow. But right. at the same time, if it's the right thing to do, then you know you take you take those arrows. Um, right. And so, you know, um, I would say you know a, a great example of that is like energy efficiency. Okay, so energy efficiency is our bread and butter. We we're not shy about getting out in front of our skis on energy efficiency. Right. Um, you know, uh, uh, somewhere around 80% of the products, home appliance products that we have that can be Energy Star certified are. And so, uh, and, and over the last uh, 10 years, you know, I think since 2009, you know, we've avoided over 300 million metric tons of CO2 initi- uh, emissions through the efficiency improvements of our products. Right. Um, and that goes directly to, to customers. So, I mean, that's an area which, I don't care what side of the politics you land on, on climate change, right? right. right? Um, that Who can argue with energy efficiency? Virtually so, nobody. No, virtually right? nobody. nobody. I mean, right. it's, wa- it's wasteful not to be efficient. And so it's one of those things where I think it's, it's um, you pick your battles, you find, you find the topics where, uh, that, are, that are material to your business, uh, and in that way, when you are focusing on them, they ring true to That's the stakeholders great. and your customers. And you inspire and, other organizations like yours, then other OEMs and others to follow suit and to, and to, and to lean into this. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not making any friends in some of our trade associations, um, you know, and we're, we're quite disruptive when it comes to innovation and our support of voluntary standards and things like that. Um, but but we do that because we know uh, we can win. Um, right. We have we have the scale and the engineering horsepower and the customer base and the product portfolio to be able to deliver on that. And you know, some some companies um, uh, don't have those advantages, and so that's the reason why we lean in on some of these more progressive issues. You know, Mark, let's go back to the issue of design for sustainability. Now, you were. You know, as, as I said earlier, you're truly the godfather of sustainability, especially of our industry, and truly one of the great leaders in sustainability overall in the world. I know it sounds odd, but I have a great view of this, and I've traveled a lot and deal with a lot of wonderful brands, and I know this to be true. But we were early. You were way early, and I followed you, and I was still early, and you were way before me. And we're, So talk a little bit about where we are today. You know, imagine... There was no chief sustainability officers when you were doing what you were doing. And then I followed you. And even when I got in the business, there was no chief sustainability officers. But so not only do we now not only have head of corporate sustainability and chief sustainability officers like you, but we've also evolved this whole issue of sustainability into ESG and and circular economy discussions. So let's talk about the issue of circularity and circular economy. If we are if we are now, uh, uh, if we're to believe, which seems to be true, that we're moving, generationally speaking, from a linear to circular economy, and there's probably or should be no going back, electronics being part of that ecosystem, which are one of the fastest growing solid waste streams on the whole planet, offer us a huge opportunity. And I always say, and you tell me if if I've got this right or if I'm missing the mark here, that it's one of the greatest untold stories in the circular economy. Because when folks like you uh, create recycling, both recycling and upcycling programs that go unnoticed, but are making a huge impact, it's a huge opportunity. And what I mean by that is, all the materials that you know and that you've dealt with for so many years that come out of electronics, steel, plastic, copper, aluminum, now gold, silver, lead, palladium, and now even the, the, the battery stuff, the cobalt, the lithium, the nickel, it's all recyclable when done responsibly and can all go back for beneficial reuse. So truly, you're sitting on top of one of the great circular economy stories 
that are out there and isn't part of what you're doing further growing that and messaging that to uh, your, your, your constituents at large? Sure. And it, and it fits into our climate strategy, too. You know, uh, this this thing has a uh, all, all the materials that we mine and we process and we make into products um, all have climate impacts um, for, a, for a mobile product. You know, 80 percent of those impacts plus are associated with the manufacturer of that product. Uh, and for that reason, you know, if we think about a circularity strategy and we talk about recycling all the time, we're drumming, we've been drumming it into our kids for generations. Right. Uh, it, you know, what we don't really talk about uh, and what we should be talking about, especially if we're going to try to solve this climate crisis, is extending the life of these products. Um, and that is not, contrary to popular belief, juxtaposed to the business uh, interests of companies that are manufacturing products. Um, you know, we we find that there are customers that want to buy brand new stuff. They're always going to be there that, that do that. Um, but then there are others uh, that want to keep their products moving uh, forward longer. And, and there are many of them. And then there are others that could never get into a flagship product, for instance, um, but might right. want a, a refurbished uh, product like our certified renewed products that comes with, you know, Samsung genuine parts and new battery and a full warranty. Um, but at a, at a significant discount and it gets them into those products, um, you know, once they realize what, what they can do. So it's very integrated, uh, you know, the way we think about this and, you know, um, you know, we, our scale is a big part of it. Um, right. We, we collect, you know, through partnerships with, with you guys. I mean, and the innovations that you guys bring to us and the capabilities you bring to us is just amazing and absolutely essential to our circularity um, goals and, and our ability to execute. But, you know, through through you um, and and some partners like like yourself, we're collecting over 100 million pounds of electronics every year in the United States. And that's and, you know, and 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 that's only about 10 percent of what we do globally. Uh, it's it's incredible. So, you know, we're on track to, I think, something like 10, uh, 10 million metric tons of e-waste by by 2030 um, globally. And I, I can't even put my head around a number like that. Um, and, and but it, it creates this opportunity, uh, right, to to get that material back. But there are two ways to look at it. One is this closed looped idea, right? Which I think is somewhat constraining. Um, it's it's good to do. It's important to do, but probably what's more important is to think about your uh, materials that are coming through your waste stream as maybe a feedstock for other processes, maybe your own, but others. And then also think about more broadly waste products that are coming from other industries as potential feedstocks for yours. Right. And so, although I like the idea of closed loop recycling, I think for a long time, it put constraints on the idea of what a circular economy looked like. You're, you're a hundred percent right, Mark, in that, like you said, all the materials that come out of are in the United States, let's say the hundred million pounds of responsibly recycled electronics that Samsung engages in on an annual basis, which is one tenth. So you, let's assume a billion pounds a year, uh, internationally, those materials, even if they don't go into new cell phones and tablets, can go into other, you know, other items for beneficial reuse, and it's staying out of landfills and staying out of the environment. That's right. Let's go back yeah. to something you just said, though, about climate change, because I, I, I the listeners, I, I need them to hear this from you. When you recycle, for instance, aluminum that comes out of your your old electronics, speak a little bit about the energy savings and the climate. It, the climate intersection that that creates and the energy savings from recycling all those materials that come out of old electronics. Sure. I mean, refining, you know, metals like, like aluminum and steel, right. Um, you know, is, is like 95% more energy intense than recycling it. Right. Uh, so it's, it's critical. And as a result of that, there's a very high recycling rate of materials like that, right. you know, 80, 80, 80 to 95%. Uh, recovery of, of aluminum and steel. And so that's great. That's a real success story, I think. Right. And we need to think about that when we're considering some of these other materials uh, that we want to bring back in. I think batteries is a, is a big one. Um, you know, if you think about it, 
batteries now as, as, as we move more towards portable electronics um, and integrated electronics and apparel and all kinds of things, right? Batteries are going to be more and more important. Never mind all the batteries we need for our EVs uh, and all the batteries that are, are going to be used for energy storage. Um, if, you, if you look at the roadmap for lithium ion technology, uh, and you and you talked about you know the the, the cobalt uh, and the and the lithium and the nickel. Right. Um, there's really only line of sight out to about 2025 in terms of where those materials are going to come from. That's and crazy. even if you want to dig up co oh. cobalt in the Congo, which nobody wants to do, right? It's you you're right. going to have to get really smart on mining these materials from waste. And it's I think it's a travesty. I don't know how to solve for this problem, John. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to have your insights on it because we've hit a wall. Um, no yeah. matter how convenient we make this, no matter how uh, how much education we put out, all the way from elementary school up through the you know when you get your your utility bill in the mail as a homeowner, it's all about recycling and recycling, recycling. But we've hit a wall. Like twenty percent uh, is about all we can get back uh, for electronics. So. That's that's a big challenge, and the other challenge is logistics. Um, when when we get these materials, yep. they're usually not where we want them. <laughs> right, right. You know, we dig them up out of the ground in places that are very well defined, but then we peanut butter spread them all over the planet once we put them into products. And so, right. getting them back is 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 a logistical nightmare, but also very costly and efficient. So, these are things that are very, very challenging pro problems that we need to address because we don't have another alternative. We literally don't have the number of planets that we need for all the materials that are gonna feed uh, the, you know, the rise of the middle class on the planet, which we all want. If you've just joined us now, we've got Mark Noon. He's the head of corporate sustainability for Samsung Electronics America. Mark, you mentioned earlier, first of all, the upcycling and the, and the secondary and tertiary markets that your great mobile devices can continually be used in. Talk a little bit about the huge announcement you recently made, which is, I think, a massive win for everybody and the environment, of course, as, as a whole and the, and the planet as a whole, uh, um, with regards to convenient repair and the and the partnership you just did with iFixit. Do you want to share a little bit about that, that groundbreaking uh, relationship and announcement you recently made? Sure. Well, it, it's a deliberate part of our strategy, which we'd set many years ago um, to expand the convenience for uh, repair for our customers. Right. Um, so we already had a very extensive uh, authorized repair network. Um, but a couple of years ago, um, we uh, realized that we could do better. And we decided to expand that um, to independent service providers. And so we have now uh, a much more extensive uh, repair network for our customers where they can go into you know, uh, small, medium-sized businesses uh, and get their products repaired uh, with Samsung authorized parts without necessarily having to go to an authorized repair center uh, where we would normally do warranty returns and things like that. So, so that really opens it up. And then going even further, you know, we understand that there are some people that are going to want to do some you know some basic repairs on on common things that are that are safe for them to repair and can be repaired in a way where the product will be reliable and so uh, that's that's uh, something we've been working on for quite some time and and as you said we just uh, announced a partnership um, with iFixit and uh, iFixit is uniquely positioned uh, to uh, interact with. Um, small repair shops, as well as individuals um, that are interested in repairing their product uh, in terms of providing them parts, uh, as well as uh, tools and, uh, and instruction on how to do that. So it's, they're a natural partner. We've been um, partnering with them for quite some time on a number of different issues. And this just seemed like a really natural extension of what we're trying to do to make uh, repair as convenient and accessible and safe as possible. You know, Mark, a few years back, I had the absolute pleasure of having lunch with you in New York City. This is way before COVID. And then you took me down to your innovation center in downtown New York, and you really gave me a great uh, window and visibility on the future of electronics. And I was very moved and inspired by that afternoon we spent together. You know, before we sign off today and say goodbye, can you share a little bit about Two things. A, what gets you out of bed every morning working at Samsung, one of the most 
iconic and ubiquitous brands now in the whole planet? And two, what's the future hold? What challenges do you get up in the morning looking to tackle, but also what things excite you besides tackling some problems and challenges as what's out there to keep doing in the future to stay ahead and make the world a better place, which I know you do every day. Yeah, well, I've been so fortunate to be part of such um, amazing companies. And, uh, and so the, the little things that myself and my team were able to do have a huge impact. And that's what gets me up, you know, in the morning, I, I really feel like even the small things that we do make a big difference. Um, but I'll tell you, as, as, as far as we've come, we have so much to do. And the, and the easy apples have already been picked up, right? So these are the tougher ones, too. Right, right. Uh, you know, I talked about metals recovery. I think yeah. we really need to do a much better job of, about that. Um, you know, m more, there's, by, fr by fractional weight, more of our products are made from metal than plastics. And we have a, a very robust uh, plastics strategy in terms of eliminating it from our packaging and also... Um, you know, adapting uh, it into our products. But I think, you know, metals, although we do some of that, we're not as deliberate as we should be. Now, some of it is just happening. You know, we talked about steel and aluminum. Just by using steel and aluminum, you know, you right. have probably 60 to 80% recycled content in your product. Right. Um, but that's a, that's a starting point. And, and we need to be focused more about this a little more deliberately, I think. Um, I also talked about reuse. I think that we've talked a lot about recycling and it's super important. If you don't have recycling, you don't have a circular economy. But at the same time, if we look at the intersection between circularity and climate, if, if, we're, if, we're, not, uh, if we're not building products to be durable and an infrastructure for those products to be used uh, longer, because the product can be fine, but the infrastructure could change, right? Uh, and so all those things have to go together, you know, then 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 really um, we're you know, missing out on some great opportunities in order to impact our our, our footprint. I think I think the number is something like uh, uh, adding another year to your mobile phone um, can uh, reduce the life cycle impact of your phone by 30 wow. percent. Um, yeah, it's it's dramatic. Um, and so, uh, it's just the opposite though on, you know, home appliances, um, you know, most of the, most of the, uh, uh, climate impact is associated with use about 80%. And so it doesn't make sense at all for you to have a very inefficient, you know, washer or dryer or TV or refrigerator in your house, um, when you can swap it out for something more efficient. So, so that's something I think reuse is really important and we need to be thinking more about that and communicating more. And then the last thing I'll point out is something that I think is more aspirational. And, and that is shifting, considering a shift to more of a service model. Hmm. Um, you know, there are some pros and cons to that uh, from, a, from a sustainability standpoint, but it sets up the right behaviors when when you have a, an interaction with your um, with your customer where there's an expectation that the material is going to come back to you. Right. Then you have an incentive to design that in a modular fashion. Mm. You have the infrastructure set up for the reverse logistics um, and you also have an incentive for that product to be used for as long as possible and upgradable. Uh, without it necessarily having to result in another piece of equipment that you're going to send, because now you're now you're doing something like instead of selling a TV, you're selling, you know, the ability for someone to have amazing content viewed in their home, right? And the TV just becomes a device for that. And so I think manufacturers have an opportunity to shift. And you know, this isn't this isn't you know anything that's revolutionary. If it was revolutionary, you'd, you'd go back to Ray Anderson and Interface right, and, right. and the way that you revolutionized the carpet industry right, right. this exact same way, right? right? And, you know, before that, you know, the carpet materials weren't even designed in a way that they could be recycled easily. Now they are. Um, before that, if you got a cigarette burn on a carpet, you replace the whole carpet. Now you replace a square. Well, imagine if you have, you know, a product that's, uh, let's say, a display that's modular and, a, and a, you know, a pixel goes out on the TV where you replace a, a segment of that array rather than the entire TV. And we are already producing TVs like that. So um, I think, 
you know, with the idea of creating modular products and driving efficiencies through that, coupled with a, uh, a service model, which is already playing out in the cell phone industry. You know, a lot of people don't own their own cell phones. They, they pay for their phone service and they get a free phone with it. Good it's point. free, right? They consider it to be free. So why can't we do that with other product sectors? Um, and I think that there's an opportunity there. So you're saying potentially in the future, electronics become part of the shared economy. That's right. Got Good it. way to put it, John. That's got it. Well, Mark, obviously, I'm the CEO of your fan club. I'm so thankful that you were able to make it on the Impact Podcast today. For our listeners and viewers out there to find Mark and his team of great sustainability experts at Samsung, please go to www.samsung.com. You can click on the sustainability section. You can find all the things they're doing in circularity and uh, uh, together for tomorrow. You know, they, they really embody that. And Mark, I really appreciate your time today. I also appreciate you not only for those reasons, but I appreciate you as a friend and someone who's inspired me the last 20 years to just do better every day. Not be perfect, but do better. And I know you're making the world a better place. You've made the better the world a better place during your whole career. And for that, I'm really grateful, but I'm even more grateful that you're my friend. Thank you for joining us today on the Impact Podcast. Thank you, John. It's my honor. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com.